or the mics? Yeah. The mic here? No. Because we have no. Uh, that's that's good. 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 Turn those off. Okay. <coughs> and some people might pop in and pop in the desk roll. We've never figured out how to do the differential thing, so. Okay. That's a shame. My knowledge it doesn't work. Off? Doesn't work. Yeah. I don't see the right number of light switches for that. Yeah. Yeah. What am I doing? It's up to you guys. If you prefer that with this, or you know, if you want to see me or the screen, it's up to you. <laughs> you don't seem to have that option. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So, uh, yeah, um, I prepared some stuff, but um, uh, I'm flexible. So if something comes up and you'd rather hear about that, or you want to dig into something, I, I can call an audible. I have other slides about other things if, if you know we want to go in those directions. Um, so just sort of let me know and yell at me um, if something comes up, we can dig into that direction. So I'm, I'm happy to follow your lead and, and talk about things you guys want to dig into. Um, so I thought I would say something about myself um, so that you know what kinds of things you might want to add. Um, so I actually am trained as a theoretical physicist. Um, I got degrees in math and physics as an undergraduate and then did a PhD in physics at the University of Chicago. Um, Originally was planning to do particle physics and, and had done a little bit of, of particle physics as an undergraduate. And then a guy came to give a colloquium about hallucinations and showed this mathematical theory of, of hallucinations and how hallucinations can develop in the dynamics and so forth. And I said, that's really cool. Um, so I had at one point thought about doing neuroscience, but as an undergraduate decided that what people do as neuroscience is not what I wanted to do. And so I went into physics, but then this sort of seemed like a good melding of the two things. And so I started working in his group and then that sort of you know, one thing led to another and here I am. Um, now, the, the big sort of phase transition, as it were, to use some physics jargon, uh, happened about 10 years ago when I came to Seattle to be in the Allen Institute. Because beforehand, I was basically doing, um, you know, pen and paper, like old school math, theoretical physics type stuff applied to neural networks, um, sitting in a corner by myself doing things that most people did not care about, um, writing papers that no one else read. And then I came to the Institute and suddenly I was part of a giant, you know, I was employee number 182 or something like that. I can't remember now, 600 people are at the Institute or something, I can't remember the number, but it's in the place. Um, being part of these massive pipelines to, to generate data and, and so forth. Uh, it's more like making, I was explaining this before, um, most people got here, but it's, it's like making phones and you're part of the team that does the whatever in the pipeline that goes from idea to releasing a phone. Um, and so there I, I, I run a team, or we a, a, a team in the so-called modeling analysis and theory group where we do all three of those things. Um, so owing to, you know, one of the things that tends to happen at the Institute is they, they don't hire enough people who know math and they don't hire enough people to do the things that need, that, 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 that need mathing. And so when they wind up with a, a deficit in something, they tend to look at the, uh, the, the people who know the math and ask them to do the thing, even if they're not trained in doing it. Um, so I wound up learning a lot of things that I wasn't trained to do <laughs> because we needed, needed those things done. Um, and so my, my team does uh, like data processing, algorithm development, uh, image processing, and so forth that all come from you know, building the data processing pipelines and so forth, in addition to doing uh, what you normally consider as like scientific data analysis and, and when we can get around to it, what stuff, stuff I actually call theory. Um, the, the stories I've sort of prepared to talk about are what I call theory, um, and so they're not the standard thing the Institute does. So if you want me to talk about institute stuff, I can call an audible and go in that direction. Um, but there are more things that I think are cool um, that are more things like you'd see a, a, a traditional, like someone who's doing theory in an academic setting does. Um, but let me know if that's not what you want to hear about. Um, I should say a few things about the institute itself. Um, so there's a bit of a mission at the institute um, to sort of try and model a kind of way of doing science that's sort of collaborative. Uh, and open, so we try to use open tools. Um, you know, we, we, we um, are Python boosters, as it were, um, as opposed to MATLAB. Um, not that we don't use MATLAB sometimes, but just we try to uh, 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 support and encourage people to use open tools. We release our own open tools. Um, as much as we can, we try to release the code that we use for the various things that I described, um, in addition to the data. So, you know, you can, I don't know how familiar you guys might be with the Institute, but you can, you know, download a Python package and start downloading our data right now uh, during the talk if you want to um, and, and analyze 
you know, data I could possibly talk about. Um, and so that's, you know, we have uh, teams of various sizes that do, you know, various um, um, scale projects from, you know, very small things to, to things that are more like building a phone where there's, you know, hundreds of people involved in doing surgeries and, and preparing data processing pipelines and carrying out the experiments and building the hardware, et cetera. Not in that order, but. Okay. So, are there any questions about anything I've said so far? Is, 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 has anything uh, uh, spurred anybody's thoughts that you want me to, to elaborate on at this point? Because I, I kind of have a weird trajectory in the sense that I don't, I'm not in a typical um, academic setting. Right? I mean, it's, some, it's sort of pseudo-academic and, and it has gotten more academic of late and is moving into a, something that looks more traditional, but it hasn't been. Um, so if there are questions people have about doing something non-traditional, uh, or how that intersects with industry or so forth. I'm happy to address anything like that. So, if anything comes up. Um, now, for myself, I, 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 I'm a theorist, because that's, how, that's sort of my, my identity. And I thought, I like throwing up this, this quote um, from Arthur Eddington. Arthur Eddington is the guy who uh, led the team that, that um, made one of the crucial experiments that verified Einstein's journal theory of relativity. Um, and so he's, famous for, for saying various things like this, and I, I kind of like this one because it's, it's important to have a theoretical concept of what your, your, uh, what your measurements are supposed to be based on. But you can't make an inference about some kind of, uh, uh, I guess the, the statistical version of this is you can't do, I, I forgot what the thing is, this is in Mackay's, Mackay's stat mac bar, uh, statistical inference book, you can't do inference without making assumptions. Right, so you have to have a thing that you start with that you either believe or, or, or posit or so forth before you can interpret data properly. Um, and so the, the theoretical physics version of this is you have to have a theory to understand, a theoretical framework to understand what you're working with. Um, and so when it comes to, it comes to the brain, I'm going to tell you a few things that some of you already know, since I understand most of you are CS people or CS adjacent people. Um, you know, lots of people like, like to talk about neural computation and theories of neural computation. And so one of the things that I think is important when you're going to throw words around like that is to think, well, what do you mean by computation in the first place? And so right in the modern sense, we have actually a very precise notion of what computation means, and it's excessively formalized um, and excessively formalized. And if you don't, I, I, people cover theoretical computation in various ways. Um, my sense is that the modern notion of doing this is just to say the church turing thesis is a thing, computers do what they do, let's get on with life. Um, whereas it's actually a beautiful set of mathematics if you're not familiar with it. If you don't know recursive function theory and you haven't seen books like Martin Davis's book on computability, I certainly recommend you look at it because this sort of goes through all the, all the nice proofs of constructing Turing machines and so forth. Um, and it's one of the best mathematical scientific books I've ever read. Um, it's one of those little, little Dover books. If, I don't even know if people still buy physical books. Um, but <laughs> it's one of those cheap little Dover books. Um, uh, and so it's, it's, it's a really nice one. Um, but so this is the thing, right? There's a mathematics here that says, you know, there's a, a, here's the set of problems you can solve. And that's the important thing, is it's not like every possible problem, right? You can't write an algorithm to do everything. Um, and usually in, in computer science, you know, the, the, the canonical problem is the halting problem. Like all the unsolvable problems, well, actually every problem reduces to the halting problem, but, but the halting problem reduces to every unsolvable problem, right? So in a neuroscience context, in, in thinking about uh, uh, computation in the brain, I, I actually think it's, it's, and there's actually a lot of domains where it's useful to think about what the undecidable problems are. Um, uh, particularly if you're not someone who thinks about computers, and sometimes even if you are. Um, like in physics, for example, this, this may not resonate with you, but in case it does. Um, the, the question of whether or not a, a multi-body dynamical system has a closed orbit. Like for example, the question of whether or not the Earth will come back to the same position in its orbit. Um, if, if I hand you a dynamical system and say, does this happen? You, there's no algorithm that will solve it. That's an undecidable problem. Um, in a neuroscience setting, the question of whether or not your model will output one spike on any given trough is an undecidable question. There's no algorithm that will tell you that in general. You might happen to know it for some reason for your purpose, but you can't solve that in general. Um, fun fact, uh, so no. Uh, fun fact, this, is, this proof involves a, a fun language called Fractran, which was invented by John Conway, uh, who was the, uh, uh, the Game of Life guy and one of our early COVID casualties. Um, it's also related to Kolob's conjecture, which seems to be getting some airplay, so people might have heard of Kolob's conjecture. Um, it's the same kind of thing. But from the uh, point of view of neurons, it's kind of cool that 
we know neurons can compute. And I mean compute in the sense that I just described. Um, so if you're not familiar with this paper, McCulloch and Pitts, this was a, these guys were famous for, uh, among other things, showing a formal proof that you can construct, uh, the, the, the paper's called something like a logical calculus image of neural activity or something like that. Um, but they showed that you know, anything that's in recursive, any, any recursive function can be represented by things that look like neurons. And so, you know, from a theoretical perspective, you're like, great, if I have a brain, I can do a computation. That's, that's a movie, right? Um, but it's in a very formal sense. So this is sort of the, an early element of what's called traditional AI, where you have you know, formal logical rules for, for um, you know, exercising a, a, you know, some particular system, as opposed to the way people think about AI now. Um, I'm going to go on a little bit of a historical tangent. I think it's interesting. Um, but stop me if not. Um, but there's this, you, you may or may not have heard the name Frank Rosenblatt. Um, yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, who, who, who was a bit of an infamous figure uh, in, in, in um, theoretical neuroscience. Um, he didn't like this approach. And so if you read his, his perceptron paper, um, he actually outlines a bunch of different reasons why he doesn't like the traditional, what is now called, I guess, the traditional AI approach. And it all has to do with sort of the variability and unpredictability of biology and the kinds of problems that biological systems have to, biological networks have to solve. And he outlined these four principles, um, two of which have to do with just variability, right? My brain is not your brain, yet we can kind of do the same thing, right? We, we can talk about you know, chairs as if it's sort of the same, like I can recognize this object and you recognize it and we can interact with it, right? We, we can talk to each other, despite the fact that we, we have different experiences and we're different people and our brains are different. Um, we have to deal with the variability of the environment, right? Every chair is not the same, for example, uh, as a very mild example, but you, know, you, have, to, you have to deal with uh, uh, quite different situations um, that you, you don't necessarily have, uh, predict. Uh, importantly, the brain doesn't stay the same. My brain yesterday is not the same as my brain today, won't be the same as my brain tomorrow. Um, and so the, the processor, as it were, is not a static thing. And then importantly, uh, this, this thing called the principle of similarity um, similar stimuli or concepts, or however you, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a mushy notion here of, of, of what a set of neural activity might mean, or a thing that the, the, the network might represent might be, but the idea is that um, um, stimuli might evoke similar patterns of activity, but not the same. So the, one thing you might infer from the first three points there is that you know, the thing you might call computation or want to call computation is actually kind of variable. Um, and so you would expect the activity that, that, that a neuron is, is um, um, exhibiting is going to be variable as well. And so that means, for example, you know, the thing that means chair in my head won't necessarily be the same as maybe means chair in your head, but they're close enough that we can kind of functionally get along with each other. Um, if this reminds you of modern deep neural networks where you get some sort of pattern of activation that not, might not be the same, but it's kind of close enough for, you know, maybe it'll work most of the time. That's kind of the idea, right? So, and he said something that, that you know, I think this is not out of place in a, a um, sort of modern conception of artificial intelligence, that the, the structure of the system is something that's derived from the environment. You can think of this as like, you have a training set, you're training a network to do a thing, and the patterns that the network learns come from this thing, right? come from the, the, the training set. Um, so I said the word perceptron, and if you're used to, if you've heard of a perceptron before, you might be surprised to see this picture, right? because this is a multi-layered thing. Right? This is from his, you know, his original perceptron paper, um, and this is how he conceived it. Right? This was a, the idea that you had the retina and a projection area, which is something like LGN, some sort of association area all the way into some virtual cortex, and this is what he was picturing, right? You have a model of computation kind of like this, um, as opposed to the thing that you see in your machine learning textbook that's called a perceptron, which is a single layer linear device, right? And the reason for that is that the only thing he made plastic was the last layer. So from a learning point of view, it really is linear, and that's what, he, he did that for technical reasons, not because he thought that was somehow important, but because that's what he had gotten to, right? He sort of hadn't gotten to the point where where he had implemented some sort of multi, what we now call a multi-layer perceptron. Um, but I think this is a moment to sort of pause in terms of thinking about how people conceive of things because it's very natural in talking about computation for people today to say, oh, if I'm going to simulate one of those things, clearly I'm just going to put it on a computer. 
but we've been talking about models of computation. And he was thinking about this as an alternate model of computation and building a thing. Right? This is not a thing he simulated on a thing. Right? We're talking about the 50s. Right? So he built this big thing that implemented these rules. He was not using a computer to simulate something like this. He was building an object that behaved this way. It wouldn't have been practical, in fact, to do anything else at the time. Um, Wait, for perceptual, where you're only talking about the visual system, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and his perception was a visual thing. Okay. So it had you know, some kind of photo diode that he would show a picture of a square or a triangle or something, and there would be a thing that lit up at the end of it saying, hey, that's a square, or that's a triangle. Right? It's a very primitive object recognition. Okay, and then he disregarded like, all the rods and frames and all the other axons that those were the processing. I don't know that I'd put it that way. I mean, he had. Okay, all of these wires and stuff that he, you know, the idea is he has a thing he calls a retina. And physically it was some little, you know, photo sensitive object that, you know, you have a, a set of these things that feeds into some other thing physically. And this, these, these, you know, electronic components that would have some sort of activation and then pass that on to the next thing. Um, and that was the constituent of, you know, his giant box here. This is, some giant thing that was filling a, uh, a portion of the Naval Medical Center in Bethesda. That was in 1958 too, so I wonder how this now modern day. Um, say it again? I said this was like in 1958. Yep. So, so I wonder how much has changed now. Uh, well, you, well, I argue that this is, you know, the thing that recognizes my face on this device wow. is a descendant of this object. But now I'm holding my hand using it to put my slide. <laughs> Um, so, um, a little historical aside on arrogance. Um, so the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that expects to be able to walk, talk, see, read, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. Later perceptrons, after the consciousness, um, will be able to recognize people and call out their names and instantly translate speech in one language, speech in read up writing in another language, it was predicted. Um, I wish I had a recording of how people responded to this quote in the last 10 years that I've shown. Um, because over those 10 years, large chunks of this have become less ridiculous, right? Um, I mean, 10 years ago, the whole thing was kind of ridiculous. Um, and now it's kind of scary, right? Except maybe to like, be conscious of people, like whatever. Um, but <laughs> you know, the, the translate language and etc. Uh, I mean, we've, we've made a, a lot of the strides in, in this with these kinds of networks. Yeah. Was the idea then that perceptron would be like a, a, an entity which could do multiple things rather than an entity which would be very good at a partial function? Yeah. 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 Okay. And he thought he was building a brain. Right. Right. That, that would be a brain in the same way that your brain is a brain. And modeled after the human capabilities of the human brain. Neuroscience itself is like a new topic back then too, right? Yep. Well, it depends on what you mean, right? I mean, the, yeah. Um, certainly, the the what we know about visual neuroscience was being established about the right you know, sort of roughly contemporaneous. Interestingly, they don't seem to have known much about each other. Right. Um, which is odd, given how the, the sort of convergence of the thought of the ideas. But uh, yeah, I find it odd that he doesn't reference them. They don't reference him. They're like different universes, it's weird, given that you think they, they should talk to each other. Um, and that they sort of converged in the, the uh, there's a, 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 a model called the Neocognitron, which is the first convolutional neural network just 10 years later that cites both of them, puts both of the things together. Um, okay, so that was sort of preamble how I think about computation and so sort of interesting things to consider in terms of building a model of, or, or thinking about theoretical constructs for the brain. Like, what does it mean to do theory with this thing? What's your, in the case of Rosenbach, he was thinking about what's the model of computation that you should use to talk about a brain. Um, there's a bunch of different directions to go here. I have a couple of, of little stories I've prepared to talk about that I think are interesting in the sense that they're sort of nice uh, examples of, uh, of thinking about just a pure theoretical question. Um, so I was going to, do, do, uh, to talk about these, uh, but these are much, much, much more focused. These are less grandiose in terms of the, the questions they answer. Um, so, cool. Sounds good. All right. Um, so one question 
is where does functional specialization come from? I'll, I'll explain that question in a minute. Um, well, now I guess. So, in the same sense that you don't have to really justify the Church Turing thesis to, to CS majors today because everybody's grown up with computers um, and has a sense of what a computer can do, uh, I, it's increasingly I don't have to really justify deep network anymore, right? Because everybody knows, oh, if you add layers to something, you train it, 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 it puts people out of, out of work or something. Um, <laughs> right, this is, a, this is a thing that happens, right? Um, I guess many, many a, uh, a, a, if you want an outline for, I don't know, half of the papers, that the, the, the introductory paragraph for half the papers, it's, there's a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of layers, it kind of looks like a brain, and it does stuff, great. Um, so we have, for example, the ventral stream, um, which is sort of the canonical, uh, um, um, or the canonical model of the, the primate ventral stream, which comes from the macaque, where you have something that looks like the perceptron, where you have a retina uh, that, that goes into the adult geniculate nucleus, and you have these series of visual areas in cortex that process ever more interesting features. Like, so V1, the, the idea is that V1 responds to edges and bars, and V2 responds to curves, eventually IT responds to the various object properties, um, and you get the so-called grandmother cells, where the, the cell responds to you know, something's face. Um, just like a convolutional neural, neural network. And I mentioned the neocognitron, there's the neocognitron right there. Right? This was a, the first convolutional net that was intended to model this kind of thing. Um, so this is not something I have to justify anymore, but it's just something that seems to happen in brains. Uh, but one thing that also happens in brains is you have pathways that specialize in things. Right? So for example, we have the, I mentioned the, the ventral stream, which recognizes object properties. There's also the dorsal stream that gives you sort of spatial awareness motion. So the dorsal stream is what's responsible for you know, something's moving in your peripheral vision, that's the dorsal stream that's, that's showing you, that's responding to that. Um, there's also local versus global motion. Local motion would be, I'm sitting here and there's a thing moving in the visual field and I can track it. Global motion is the motion induced by the fact that I'm walking around and the entire visual field is moving. Those are handled by largely two separate pathways that talk to each other. Um, and there's a bunch of other examples we can pick up. But so one question is, you know, how does this happen? And this could happen in a bunch of different ways. One could be that, you know, from a, engineering standpoint you can say great I have a cost function for this thing and a cost function for that thing it's basically just two different networks that maybe have a common uh, a common origin fine I do that and that's that's fine from an engineering perspective um, who knows how this arises from from the point of view of the brain right you've got a single behavioral output I shouldn't say single but there's a top level behavioral output and there's the uh, the sensory input and you have the generic question of given that one cost function, if you will, that is, you know, be alive long enough to reproduce, why do you have the functional specialization? You know? So I'm gonna give a toy version of this, but one of the, the, uh, the, the, the things that, this is gonna look like it has nothing to do with the Institute, but it's in fact inspired by work we did at the Institute. So one of the, the big data sets we have is this large scale mesoscopic connectivity of the mouse brain where the, the experiments that were done were, were retroviral injections into areas of the brain that allows us to trace back the connectivity among different regions at a large scale, not individual neurons, but like visual cortex is connected to lateral geniculate nucleus this way and motor cortex is connected to something else this other way. And so we can trace sort of how large scale regions are connected to each other. And what it looks like is that the visual system is actually highly parallel. Instead of being something that looks like you've got V1, V2, whatever, you've got V1, or, uh, something like VISP is what we call V1 uh, in the mouse brain, and it spreads to all these other visual areas. And we have no idea why. We have no idea what the function of those other areas is. We just know anatomically they spread out to all these areas before we converging into some other things. Um, and so the question is, like, why do you have all this? Like, why do you have this large parallel structure? And so it's possible that these are all different functionally specialized pathways. And so a question arose for us, it's like, how do you understand this? Like, what's, what's the learning dynamics in this set of pathways? Um, and so we decided to look at a very, very simple model of this, where I'm just gonna take what would be a multi-layer perceptron and cut it down the middle, right? And so I get some generic, and not necessarily cut it once, but have basically multiple pathways, where I have some input over here, it goes through some sequence of, 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 uh, of layers, and maybe there's two pathways, maybe uh, I've just shown two here, but maybe there's three, four, five, whatever. Um, and then there's some output function. And so the question is, how do you, how do learning dynamics work in this? If I move through this too fast, please stop me. 
Um, if I'm saying things that don't make any sense, please stop me. Um, so we're going to look at this specifically in the in the concept in the uh, the case of doing regression. So not, not only you think about categorization like image net or something, we're going to do a regression problem, and so we're going to have a, a mean squared error, a, a, a L2 mean squared error, which is just saying that here's my network output, it attacks some particular input, and I want the that to be close to some output. Um, yep, sir. I just have a kind of unrelated question out of curiosity, but like you said that. Um, you used a retrovirus to yeah. track the connectivity. Does that mean there's like a virus that like changed the genome of the new, uh, the neurons in that state? Or did oh no no. So you have a brain, yeah, um, uh, extracted brain yeah. um, from from a, a, a mouse that no longer needs it, as it were, um, and you you inject a what's called a, a um, anterograde adenovirus. And so this is a virus that goes back through the connectivity um, in the, the opposite direction of how it would normally go, so back through the things that innervate that cell. And it's carrying GFP. Mm. Um, and so what happens is that it, everything, you get a, a blob of where the injection is, you get a, a blob of, of sort of glowing goo. Um, and then in all the places that connect to that, on the specific neurons, through the specific tissue, they also glow. Mm. And then you just take, literally take an optical image of that. And then you have to reconstruct from that how this area is connected to this area, et cetera. And so you get a matrix from that uh, of the relative strength of connectivity. Okay. But it's literally just measuring, optically measuring the mass of tissue. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, where was I? Okay. Um, so this may not be obvious depending on, on your background, um, but. This is a linear regression problem, essentially, if this is a linear network. And if this is a linear network, then what happens is the, the effective, uh, 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 after training, if I, if I do gradient descent on this cost function, I basically get that the action of that network is equivalent to, to the, um, the correlation of the input and output. That may not look like linear regression, but if you look in your machine learning textbook at your, at your linear regression solution, that's effectively the formal definition of, uh, that's the formal solution for linear regression, assuming the input correlation is, is uh, the identity. Everybody's cool with that, all right, nice. Um, so let's unpack what that means first. So let's imagine I'm trying to learn some association between things and properties. I know I said I was gonna do a regression problem, not showing a categorization problem, it's just an illustration. Um, one can still do it. Um, and so, for example, you know, canaries grow and move and they fly, et cetera. Um, and so I can break this down using a singular value decomposition. So are those words okay with everybody or do I need to unpack what SPD is? I can do that. Uh, can you explain that? Yes, absolutely. So any matrix has what's called a singular value decomposition. So what that means, is, and this is any matrix, I don't care what it is, any matrix I can write down as some matrix U times some matrix S times some matrix B, where S is diagonal, and U and B are orthogonal. Um, it is not at all obvious, if you're familiar with principal component analysis, this U and this V are intimately related to the principal components, if that helps. If it doesn't help, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but the point, the, the, the importance of this from this point of view is each of these columns and each of these rows are going to be the coincident set of things that vary in the data. Now, that may sound a little weird, but for example, um, maybe you have a whole bunch of things that grow and a whole bunch of things that, that have roots and so forth, but I've only got a finite set of data. And so there's gonna be correlations amongst these things because I've got a finite set of data, right? Even if hypothetically you might have every, every possible combination. So what doing this decomposition does is separate out the ways things co-vary into the actual uh, uh, things that will happen, right? So for example, maybe even though I've got all this, this, these different relationships, you know, you can imagine a situation where, well, so for example, everything grows, right? So this is not really informative, right? And so grow is just has this one, um, um, this one particular box here. Uh, it shows up in one component because everything grows and doesn't really, if I tell you 
if, if you're trying to figure out which object I showed based on the properties, if I tell you it grows, it doesn't matter for it, right? It doesn't vary across the data. So what these columns capture in the U and the V are the ways that these properties jointly co-vary over the data. Um, the importance here is that these things tell you the strength of those covariant properties. What is what? The negative. The negative. Where is the negative? Like the V color. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, um, it, it, helpful answer. Um, the unhelpful answer is it means negative. Um, <laughs> so the, the absolute numbers here don't have a, the, the, the only their relative values matter. The absolute number doesn't. And so, the uh, one way to think about it is if it's positive, the things vary together. If it's negative, they vary against each other, right? Um, but there's an ambiguity in, in how I describe this because I can multiply both u and v by minus signs, and I get the exact same singular. I, I get a decomposition of the same matrix. So the singular value becomes just not is not unique. That's an important thing to keep in mind if you ever use it in the future because people, not saying I haven't done this. Um, can get confused that by thinking that this is in fact a unique comp decomposition, it's not. It, there, there's a whole family of ways of decomposing something into these three matrices. Um, the S's will be unique, though. Okay. So the large scale idea here is that this decomposition basically tells me what's in my input output relationship. It tells me how the input relates to the output and how things vary with the result. It's basically a, a way of thinking about understanding my data. So my question is going to be, how does the network think about these different components? How does it, how does it think about these different pieces? Um, and so uh, a, a little lesson for telling stories about your, your science, set up the right strawing. So here's my strawing. Um, so I have a network with a bunch of different channels. Right, that was my, I've got it's my ventral stream, my dorsal stream, whatever. And I wanna know how these things evolve. And so one question is going to be, how do these singular values decompose across the different channels? Right, so I've got these coincident um, uh, uh, factors that tell me how the different properties and object labels vary across the data, and I want to know maybe one channel learns one of them and another channel learns another, or maybe they just sort of divide evenly across the different channels. So maybe channel one learns that birds grow and, and et cetera, and channel two also kind of learns that birds grow and whatnot. And at the end of the day, the whole network sort of looks at all the different channels and says, okay, I want to take a little bit of information from channel one, a little bit of information from channel two, a little bit of information from channel three. That's what hypothesis A is. Is that you just maybe it maybe it just spreads out across the different channels and you add it all up. Hypothesis B says maybe what happens is each of these goes to one particular channel. Maybe one important feature goes to channel one, another important feature goes to channel two, and another important feature feature goes to channel three. There's a reason I'm asking this question this way is because the answer is B. Right? I wouldn't ask this question if that were <laughs> the answer. Um, so what do we do with this? So we do something crazy, right? So deep networks work because you put a nonlinearity in each, in, in between each each um, layer, right? Um, because if you didn't, you could just collapse everything into a, a linear network, right? And just have one layer because major, you, know, you multiply two matrices, you get another matrix, why bother? So we're gonna throw away the nonlinearities. That's crazy. Um, why is that not crazy? The reason it's not crazy is because we're asking, well one, here's my hand waviness. Um, you have to know when to wave your hands. So here's where I'm waving my hands. If I'm training a network to do something, um, say if I've got a hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity, I'm gonna suggest to you that the best place for that network to be is right where that, right at the middle of that um, uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent. I didn't get that. Well, I'm trying to explain it. <laughs> um, the best place for that network to be is right in the middle of that hyperbolic tangent where it's linear, because that's where it has the maximum dynamical uh, uh, range. It doesn't have to be, but I'm suggesting that's where it's going to want to be, because for example, if all of my units, uh, if all of my weights train everything such that you've saturated nonlinearity, it's not doing anything. It can't distinguish any of the inputs from themselves. So the natural place for it to be for anything that's interesting is going to be where that you're mostly linear. Yep. Is this whole activation like wave or just unbounded activation? What a great question. So, um, 
Yes and no. So, so the claim is that you want to st the network's going to want to stay away from places where it's not going to learn anything. So for example, what a network with reloads is not going to want to do is turn everything off, right? Everything's not going to get moved such that you're, the weight, you're not going to move the weights such that everything is below the threshold, mm -hmm. right? So what you're going to try and do is put the weights in a place where everything can be uh, usefully distinguished. Right. And I'm claiming that, uh, and, and this is by no means an apt claim. It, what I'm saying is literally false. But um, the claim is it's kind of maybe okay morally true because, um, the network's going to be want to be in a place where it can distinguish stuff, and therefore pretending it's linear is kind of a reasonable approximation for that for my purposes. Okay. Again, I want to emphasize that's a false statement, yeah. and I know it's a false statement. Um, the proper thing to do here, and so so the reason I'm making this false statement is because I can do the math when it's linear, mm -hmm. right? And so there are two possibilities at this point. I do the math, I get a cool result. And then I switch over to my nonlinear networks, and nonlinear networks say, you made an assumption that's not valid, not gonna work. So here, here's the, the, the big trick. You do the math in a region, you can do the math, and you say, okay, now let me go and look at the real thing and see if it still works, right? So the spoilers, of course it still works, otherwise it would be telling the story, right? But that's how you have to do it, right? You know, you submit your paper to NeurIPS and then everybody complains, I don't care about this, I care about nonlinear linear networks, so you do the simulations, you show it works, and they're like, okay, great, you can have your NeurIPS paper now. Um, that, that's how that went. Um, okay, so here's the fun part. Um, the learning dynamics for this are things I, where I, I can write down the exact learning, the exact gradient descent dynamics, and it's this scary looking ODE. Right, so I now have a dynamical equation I can solve. I can, I can do um, your dynamical systems analysis on this, on, on this system and ask what happens um, to, the, uh, to the weights. And that's the reason I did this. If I didn't have this, this would be a hard thing to solve because I would have a bunch of phi primes. Um, I didn't name a nonlinearity, but I would have a bunch of derivatives of nonlinearities, and now I wouldn't have a, a system that I could solve very easily. But in fact, this I can write down exactly. Poof. So I'm gonna make a couple of assumptions that are gonna help me out. One, I'm going to assume that the layers are infinitely wide. And I'm going to assume that the, the initial values are drawn from zero mean Gaussians with a small width that vanishes as the size of the, the layer. This lets me use various limiting, um, this basically lets me take various useful limits, again, so I can do the math. Similarly, I'm gonna have to check in the end whether this applies to realistically sized networks, right? Um, so I don't expect you to digest that equation. Um, it's mostly there as, as proof of, yeah, I, I have an equation, there it is. Um, but what this is, is supposed to be, so, so when you make these assumptions, in fact, you wind up with a, um, or you can, you can convert the system into a place where you get a set of equations that are very simple, kind of too simple. Um, this is, in fact, a two-dimensional system. Um, I'll show you some phase planes in a minute. Um, for the representation of the singular values in each channel. That's a bunch of words. Um, so what, is, what am I talking about here? So what you can do, so you've got an input, you've got a bunch of responses. So what I can do is, and, and the thing I had told you about before, the SVD gives me a way of talking about how the inputs and outputs relate to each other. So I've got a variable that says, okay, here's my object properties and here are my objects, and here's how they relate to each other. I can use that to define a coordinate system in my network, right? It tells me how things vary. Now this is super abstract at this point. I can do it, but the, the important thing is I have a number that I can associate with how the network changes as I move through my data set. And I can use that to define coordinates in, in the neurons, the set of neurons. Um, and so for each one of those uh, variables that describes this association, I have a dynamical system, or a dynamical variable. It's just like a position or a velocity or something like that in, in some dynamical system. And it turns out that this becomes, for each one of these singular vectors, I get a really, really simple set of equations. I don't expect you to digest the math, don't worry. Everybody's kind of looking like, oh my gosh. And that's a reasonable response. Um, but it's the, the concept that I want to that I want to try to get, get across is that you can make basically make a coordinate transformation and get a really simple mathematical system. 
That's sort of the high level idea. And what the coordinate system does is a set of coordinates that tell you how the, uh, the input output map, uh, the, the properties of the, the input set and the output set relate to each other. Yes? So like, what does it mean to be at like zero, zero of this coordinate system? Great question. Um, so, um, I could have come up with a killer example if I had thought about this uh, this way. Um, so, let's think about some properties, right? So, I have, in this case, these are uh, like animals and plants, right? And so, as I look across my different animals, I'm going to have different amounts of, say, growth and movement and so forth. And so, the coordinate system here describes how these things co right? So I might have a variable. Let's just look at growth for a moment. Because I've got two different, uh, one of the things that, that makes this hard to visualize is I've got two different sets of things I'm correlating. And this describes how those two different sets of correlated things co are correlated together. So let's eliminate one of them for the moment. Um, let's just say I've got growth. And I'm, I'm kind of picking up, actually, let's, let's take movement here. Each of these things has a different rate of movement. Each of these things move at, at rate zero. Right? And so as I look through different animals, let's imagine I have a bunch of these. I only have four things right here, but let's imagine I have 100 animals. As I look through the animals, they're going to have different rates of movement. Mm -hmm. right? And so there's an average rate of movement, and that's essentially zero as far as the animals are concerned. Right? And so this, this deconstruction just basically tells me that if I just look at the growth variable, it tells me how everything, uh, how the entire set of, of uh, the data is going to change. Okay. It's cool if that doesn't make sense because that was a little weird. But um, for example, um, imagine I take chunks of of animals. So I've got maybe the slow animals and the fast animals and the, the medium speed animals and so forth. Then there's this arbitrary variable. I should say arbitrary, abstract variable that compiles that property according to that group of animals and will vary across those groups. Mm -hmm. And that's like my coordinate. Okay. Um, and if you want to go one step closer to what's happening, there's really a set of properties, like speed and how fast you grow and size and so forth, and all of those things co-vary together. Is this still two-dimensional? Um, it, no, it's no, like it's, it's multi-dimensional. So every one of these, the, num the, the size of the, yeah. the, the, di the number of diagonal elements of this matrix is the number of dimensions we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. And so, in general, for like an actual like image net or something, if you if you did some decomposition, that, there would be lots of these, right? There would be oodles of these 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 things. Here, it's a very simple example where you got four things and eight, seven properties, and so you just get four um, uh, singular outputs. I know there's a question. Yep. Does the linear model still work as much like it with our type models? Uh, sorry, one more time. Does this sort of linear simplification still work? want to look at uh, recurrent models? Ooh, um, it could. So if you wanted to think about recurrent models with this framework, um, it's a good question. Um, so what would happen is this dynamical system would change. So let me unpack this for a second. So this is just, I've got a, a weight at depth D for channel A, and this just tells me how it changes in time, where time is iterations of training. Right? So time is not like literal time, it's, it's, it's training iterations. Um, so if I had a recurrent network, this D would go away because a recurrent network would be the way you would train that with backdrop is you would unfold it and now it looks like one of these networks where the weights are shared across every layer. And so you'd basically just erase that D. But the equation would otherwise stay the same. Right. I have no idea what the results of that would be because I haven't done that, but that's how you would do that. Um, where are we going here? Okay, so this is weird. This is perhaps a little more digestible. Uh, assuming you're willing to accept the conceit of these things being coordinates in this input-output relationship. Um, so what I've got here are face planes. Everybody know what a face plane is? No, that's cool. Um, sorry, I'm a physicist. I assume everybody knows what a face plane is. I know it's not true. Um, so if I have a dynamical system, like, uh, and I also assume people like dynamic systems, cool. Um, so 
uh, a stupid joke I remember hearing as a graduate student is, um, um, maybe it's not even a joke, whatever, stupid statement, um, is, is the, the fundamental um, concept in physics is things move. That's all you need to know. Um, and so in, in, in some sense, there's a truth to it in, this, in that for a physicist, everything is some dynamical equation. I have some d by dt of a thing equals some stuff. And so I have some differential equation I have to solve that tells me how something changes in time. So uh, canonical examples being I've got a spring, right? And the, the, the important, you know, you have a ball on a spring and it's moving. And so the important variables there are the position and the speed of the ball. And so there's gonna be a dx dt equals blah, where x is the position, and dv dt equals blah, where v is the, the velocity, right? So a face plane is going to be the x times the plane of the trajectories of that spring, right? So for a, for a, a normal spring, that's a, that's a, the, the, the equivalent thing here would be position and velocity, and you would see a circle, because that's what happens with a spring, right? It just oscillates, and so that trajectory is a circle. If it's a damp spring that slows down, that's a spiral that goes into the center, right? So that's an example. Those are examples of phase planes. So what this is, all of these lines, the black lines are the trajectories, like the trajectory of that spring, in this arbitrary co artificial coordinate system for my, uh, my network, where this axis is one of the coordinates for one channel, or the coordinate for one channel, and this axis is the coordinate for another channel. And so this is how the two channels compete in terms of how they represent information. And so if the channels share information, then what you would expect is for this to basically sit right in the center. That means the two coordinates are even. So whatever information is in that coordinate is shared across both channels. So the important result here is the fact that as I go this way, I'm increasing my depth. And so what happens with the increasing depth is these black lines diverge. When they diverge, the information is only in one channel or another. Increasing the depth of the network? Yep. Like exactly. More layers? Yes, exactly. Precisely. So as I add layers, each channel says, no, no, no. This information is mine, right? How, but so you were you you're using all this math is done using no activation. It's all linear, right? So how does adding more layers do anything in terms of the equations? Um, aha! Great. So there are two things that are happening here. One. So there's a you're you're borrowing a good bit of intuition but the wrong bit of intuition. So having more layers doesn't change the computational property, right? For precisely the reason I mentioned earlier, that if I don't have the nonlinearities, I can just crush everything into a single matrix. Why bother, right? However, what I'm doing essentially is a matrix decomposition, right? So depth D basically says, instead of being, tracking one matrix, I want to track D of them, right? And so even though the functional properties of the system haven't changed, the learning dynamics are going to be different because I'm looking at dynamics at each layer. And the important thing here is this product over the number of layers. And so what happens is I get basically a, a, a um, does, the, does the phrase power integration mean anything to you? No. No, <laughs> cool. Um, a cool trick for finding the largest eigenvector, uh, to, or like the largest eigenvalue of a matrix. You know what an eigenvalue is, yes? Yes. Awesome. Um, cool trick, take a matrix, at least a square matrix, multiply it by itself. Keep doing this over and over and over again, right? So the thing, the thing that's going to become large in that is the largest eigenvector, right? Because that's what's going to multiply over and over and over again. It's, going to, it's basically it's, it's called power iteration because you amplify the effect of the strongest component, right? Uh, there's a little more to it, but that's the basic idea. Um, so part of what's happening here is whatever the network is learning, there's a power iteration through depth, and so there's a little bit of things. If there's something slight to distinguish channel one from channel two, they're gonna diverge. It's not that one channel is learning, um, learning any less in some sense, but it's not learning as fast because it, 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 the, the different, whatever, whatever difference they started with gets amplified as you go through the depth in some sense. Now there's another thing, uh, which we don't often talk about with linear regression, which is an important part of linear regression, which is called explaining away. It's an important part of statistical inference too. Um, so if I have two possible things that could explain something, knowing about one of them makes the other less likely. Right? The canonical example is um, you have a burglar alarm in your house 
And so I, the burglar alarm can be set off by an actual burglar or by an earthquake, right? And so if you're like at home and your phone's going off saying, you know, your alarm's ringing, something's going on, you're like, oh, somebody's breaking into my house. Then you hear a report on the radio, there was an earthquake in blah, blah, blah area. Now you're like, great, nobody's breaking into my house anymore. That's an example, of, that's an inference you're doing that's explaining away because the other explanation is now less likely because you've just learned the first explanation. Right? So this happens in linear regression as well, where you've got two possible regressors that you're using to explain your data. If one of them can explain the data, you don't need the other one to explain your data. Now mathematically what's happening is I've got all of the possible explanations here are what's being summed over here, and they all add up to this thing. This actually shows up in my phase planes. Come on. That's actually what's happening here, is what's making this deviation happen is this explaining away. If I can explain a, a piece of the data from one channel, I don't need the other. And so it's a combination of these two effects. You still have this effect over here, it's just very small in the shallow network. So you combine the explaining away with the power iteration and suddenly one channel wins and the other does not. Um, so, a lot of that was super abstract. Um, let me give you an actual, honest to goodness, real world example of this in action, which hopefully, if you've been confused this far, thus far, hopefully this will, will help. So, you may or may not recognize this. This is taken from AlexNet, it was the AlexNet paper. And because of, uh, it was the dark ages and they didn't have massive GPUs and whatnot, they had to implement this on two different GPUs. Right, so the actual architecture is parallel, right? Because they had to use two GPUs and separate. It's, it's not quite parallel because they've got some of these crossing connections, but for the most part, it's two parallel channels. And a phenomenon that they observed but could not explain is the fact that on GPU one, they learned textures by and large. And on GPU, GPU two, they learned color. And it occurs to me I should have shown you this picture a long time ago. Um, so another answer to the what the hell is this abstract coordinate system is this. Right? I have a type of feature, in this case it's texture because it's all these oriented Gabor-like gradings. These are, these are basis functions that describe textures of images. Or I have colors. Right? These are large scale properties of the images. And so the claim we're making, Sorry, yeah, <laughs> the claim we're making here um, is that um, is, is, this is what, right? It, it's two parallel. Um, uh, it, it's a parallel deep network, and so each of these features was learned in one of the two two uh, uh, channels. Okay, um, that was that story. Is everybody comfortable? Yes, Eric, Eric's on this paper, yeah. And Pino Iris, Iris is the first author of this paper. She just graduated, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't think anymore. Okay. Um, um, I noticed it's seven. I'm happy to be talking, but uh, that's the end of that story. So, a lot of abstract stuff, but I'm happy to, to dive into it or, or whatever. Yep. So, like, the sort of purpose of this is to say like okay this is why the brain um, has this parallel pathways because they are learning different ways to explain the data um, but then I'm, what I'm struggling with is the linear assumption because like the brain oh. isn't linear right so then I promised something I didn't give it to you um, is it here uh, oh well Okay, I don't have a good figure for it. Um, that's my fault. Um, so, something I should have added. You can test this with nonlinear systems. Still works. So th those are, you know, I showed you phase planes. If you do an actual simulation of the dynamics, it works. Um, and if you add things like hyperbolic tangent and, and relu as nonlinearities, you still get the same quality of behavior. You still get the same separation of channels. So, so the math seems to work. So you're saying like there exists some math that we could have done for nonlinear systems that would have worked, but we just had to make the linear assumptions so we could do the math. Um, uh, yeah, if you add a negative to the first clause of your sentence. Um, 
um, there's math we can't do because of the nonlinearities. And so we changed yeah. it to math we could do, and then we hoped and prayed that the math we could do gave us good predictions for the math we can't do. Okay. Gotcha. This is one of the tricks of the theorist. You gotta figure out which problems you can solve. So to summarize, we just proved it theoretically for linear systems and then extended that experimentally to a nonlinear system. Correct. That's okay. exactly what we did. Yep. That's exactly what we did. And basically that reduction to those things that have phase planes, that's the thing that I couldn't do if I left the nonlinearity. And unless I didn't, you know, I could I could be more formal about the approximation because I could have derived it for the nonlinear case and then said, oh, if I'm in such a, you know, mathematicians do these sort of things, right? If I'm in such and such a limit that I can take this nonlinearity and treat it as an approximate linear thing, then I can have some expansion and I could have written a whole bunch more painful equations to get, you know, some first order behavior that would do exactly this. And then have some bounds that says as long, you know, as long as I'm within you know, this, this region, this approximation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to me, that doesn't add a whole lot of, I mean, it's a potentially good thing to do, but in this case, a lot of work that I don't think adds value. It's easier to say, here's my approximation, here's my math, and here's the demonstration that approximation works. That's the same idea. Um, but you bring up some good points. So, so this is not by any means like a complete story in the sense that as far as brains are concerned, I, I haven't told you like why you have channels. I've told you if you have multiple channels, here's why you might have feature specialization. Um, because, you know, like I said at the beginning, if you're engineering something, you might say, okay, I want my ventral stream to be object recognition. So I'm going to put an object recognition cost function. And I want my dorsal stream to be motion, so I'm going to put a motion cost function. Done. But the brain doesn't do that, right? There's nothing that says, oh, you know, this region is going to do this, and this region is going to, at least we don't know what those things are. There's nothing that imposes that that we know about. So you could get some functional specialization purely as a function of depth if the two things are trying to explain the same data. Right? So if, if the channels combine in some way, which they do because you know, every, every separate channel, separate channel in your brain is feeding into your behavior, right? So that's a common cost function that you have with the environment. And so the, the, the high level suggestion I wanna make from this toy model is that you might have functional specialization emerge purely as a result of common convergence on a cost function and depth. That by itself is enough to give you functional specialization. And that's, that's an, so to me, that kind of result is like super cool because it's very simple, but it's very general. Yeah. Right? And it's backed up with, with a, a, a relatively straightforward set of math as opposed to, it's not like an empirical thing where we, we showed this and said, oh, it kind of works, here's an idea. This is a very constrained set of, uh, of, of, of math. Can you go back to your yeah. Um, slide about the depth, the thing that did the depth. The face planes? Yeah. Face yep. planes. Um, and so the purple part is. I, is oh, that, sorry, yes. Right. That's like you imposed that basically? or? Um, yeah, I should have explained the whole graph. I'm sorry. I went through it too fast. Um, the, the purple are the vector, is the vector field describing the, I'm going to use the jargon for a minute, the phase flow of the dynamical system. Mm -hmm. So. If you think of the diagonal system as I've got you know, dx dt equals blah, dv dt equals blah, that's a vector in my phase space that describes the direction I'm going, right? So these little lines with the arrows, that's where the dynamical system is telling me to move at that particular point. Sir? Sorry, I just remembered a word from one of my classes. Is the middle thing a null line? Oh, dude. Um, no, but well done. Um, uh, so the null clines are the places where one of the coordinates derivatives is zero. Yeah. Um, it's, just, it's just like the stable, it's the... Um, it's, the it's the steady state. Yeah, steady exactly. State. Yeah. So, so these are all of the possible zero states. Okay. So if you're on this line anywhere, you're not moving at all. Okay. Um, but if you're anywhere else, you're going to follow the direction of the arrows until you get to this line. And so that's, if, you're, if you're near zero, you're going to move in this curve until you get to the line, unless you're exactly at zero, in which case you're going to go straight to the middle. And the point is, the, the, the higher your depth, the smaller a perturbation you need before you head to one, one extreme or the other. Right, but it looks like the purple lines don't differ, like the vector field doesn't differ that much between depths. Uh, that's, I, yes, that's a fair 
optical assessment. But somehow, like, it seems like there's just more perturbation at the beginning for ah, higher depths. Great question. So, um, I anticipated this problem, and so when I made these figures, all of the initial conditions are the same. So the, the 100 points that start here are the exact same 100 points over here. So are the vector field actually, like, these ones diverge way more than these ones then? Correct, yep. That's exactly where the trajectories come from. I, I agree that if you just look at the purple, it's harder to tell, yeah. but I think it's just an optical problem. Um, it's entirely possible it's just a problem of the, the automatic fancy software that draws a vector field, how it chooses to create the, the density of the lines, which is the reason I made this plot this way, so you can see the density of the, the, um, the, the distribution of trajectories. So I think it's easier to see the black curves than the, than the base one. Yeah, definitely. But I agree with you that visually it's not obvious. Yep. So like, what other questions about the brain are you trying to answer in like a similar fashion, I guess? Or um, what, yeah, what, what remains to be answered? What remains to be answered? Well, so even on here, right? So there's a whole bunch of stuff for this problem by itself, mm -hmm. right? So one, I haven't told you, for example, it, it, it's easy to interpret the, I often have to work really hard um, because everybody wants to interpret, and I even want to interpret this way, um, as if I've described a winner-take-all system across different singular values. Um, so I showed you an example for a single singular value. So for example, this learns texture and this learns color. Mm -hmm. In the theory as I described it, nothing says that maybe this channel just says, hey, the rest of y'all can go home, I'm gonna explain this myself. And so one channel might learn everything, mm -hmm. and the rest of the channels might be random. Mm -hmm. Nothing of the math I did explains why that may or may not happen. Okay. Yeah. And so that's an interesting problem, right? Why, like, is it, if you did, because I'm guessing, if you did this a bunch of times, you would rarely get a system where one GPU learned everything. So that's an interesting question, why is that? And I think I know why. I can give you a high level answer, but we haven't done the math for this. And it's because of these normalization steps. Well, there's these two things, and I, I can't remember if this is the normalization step, but I know they implemented a normalization step at various points. And I think that normalization step produces a winner take all effect across the different uh, singular values. That's a conjecture. I don't know that that's true. But that's an example of a question I don't know. I, don't, I can't definitively say I know the answer to. Um, I also assumed a number of channels. Right? I assumed I had a certain number of pathways. But maybe in a more, in a more general system, uh, like your developing brain, maybe not, maybe there's no genetic thing that says, okay, we're gonna have a ventral stream, we're gonna have a dorsal stream. Maybe that emerges through some particular dynamics that is consistent because of a rule like this, but I haven't shown that. Okay. So that's another interesting question, is why would you have a certain number of channels, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But like, things are in pretty, like surprisingly consistent places across brains, right? Yep. So exactly. There's gotta be some information that like guides it specific to do specific things, right? Yes, and maybe. I, 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 can, I can buy your intuition, uh, and it's probably true to some extent, but it could just be a perturbation, right? You could have a system, uh, a situation like this, where the only thing that's genetically encoded is that, that perturbation. Like you're gonna be slightly over here, and the dynamics of things is, okay, now I'm gonna form a ventral stream and a dorsal stream, mm -hmm. right? This is also, so one of the things you, you kind of, uh, it's a, I hesitate to say this, but I think it's true. Um, you get um, things where there's a common bifurcation and also a common exception. Um, I think a good example is right-handedness and left-handedness. Right? Most people are right-handed, but a consistent number of people are left-handed. So I'm totally making something up here, but that's entirely possible when there's a mechanism like this where or a mechanism of similar flavor, where for most people the perturbation goes this way, but every once in a while it flips, right? And that could be a random thing, but the dynamics of establishing that one is dominant over the other is the dynamical part, where it's the thing that makes it, you know, that, that chooses which way you bifurcate is either genetically encoded, actually in that case it's not genetically encoded, but, um, is, is due to some random factor, which may be genes, it may be environment, depending on which, which um, one more answer to your question. I don't, I don't think I have time to, um, depending on what you guys want to do. 
Um, but one more thing, and I want to at least state the question uh, because it's another answer to your, your question, and that's that I don't, for example, have a good sense of the kinds of problems uh, of, of, of our, let me just ask this question. So one desirable feature you might want is for a network, um, for, for an organism, to be flexible with respect to the problems it's going to solve, because it doesn't know what environment it's going to live in, right? Um, now, that's not a guarantee. You could say, oh, evolution might say, here's your environment. I'm going to program you to respond to this because I know your environment. You need to be able to see, you need to be able to do these things, and it's very consistent, done. But you may have, it, it, you can imagine, I don't think it's, it's too, too hard a, a, a stretch to say, it's desirable to within some region to have a, the ability for, the, for a computation to be flexible in the sense that a priori before development, I don't know what problems I'm going to have to solve, and I'm going to have to figure them out. Right? Math didn't exist during development, but somehow I have to do math because it's important for my livelihood, so I have to figure that out um, as, a, as, a, as one example. Um, and so a way to think about this is that you, you have um, a bunch of different weights, and they are constrained by tasks. I'm going to at least show my cool animation. I made an animation. Um, right? And so some weight dynamic says, OK, if I'm in training for task one, I'm going to be there. And at the same time, you have constraints that I've only got so much neural stuff. Right? I've only got so much, uh, uh, oh, you, know, synap you know, only so many synapses, only so many neural fibers, et cetera. And this box here is my set of constraints. Right? I can't just, you know, I don't have a computer where I can just say, let the weights be any, double, any, any real number, but they've got to be within some box that's, only my, that's all the amount of stuff I have. And so, my first statement about teaching uh, training could have been that you know evolution might say, okay, I need my constraints here because I have to solve task one. But you might have a situation where the constraints need to be consistent with a bunch of different tasks. And so I don't have time to unpack this entire story, but one of the things that we did was ask about a theory of connectivity that assumes that you want to make this box as big as possible, given constraints that we know you have. And so that, that makes, that gives for a certain statistics of connectivity, and we want to know, like, if we assume that that's the thing that governs your initial statistics, what, you know, is that, is that a reasonable model of connectivity? And the short version of the story is that if you look in, um, this theory predicts that you have a linear synapse count versus the number of presynaptic partners if you are flexible. And if you look in Kenyan cells, which are these cells in the fruit fly, you wind up seeing that the young Kenyan cells have this linear dynamic, and as the cells mature, they specialize into something else and become less flexible. That was a lightning fast version of that story. But that's another example of thinking about the computational properties of, of the network and how they arise and how they have consequences for the structure of the network. Wait, what is that big, like, empty gap the adults one in like C and D? Uh, the unhelpful answer is there ain't no data there. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, why, I can imagine, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I can imagine that there is some continuum there, but these are snapshots of different uh, of cells of different ages, right? These, these, are, these, are, these are based on different electron micros microscopic reconstructions of, of um, uh, of Kenyan cells at different levels of maturity. Oh, this is from your paper, actually. Yes. Okay. Well, no, this data is not from my paper. I mean, these plots are in our plots. The data is from Geneva. Okay. okay. Um, but yes, I am talking about my paper. I don't know if you know Kenyan. Um, so that's another example of the kind of, of, uh, of, of theory. Um, another thing is, is if you have multiple, you know, one thing people try to do um, is is use what's called task training, where you say, okay, I want a network that does object recognition. Do the features in the object recognition help me predict neural responses? And so this raises a question, if I'm gonna train something to do task one, predict neural responses, and train it to do task two, do object recognition, does that help me? Right, and it may not, right? You could, you, you could work backwards. It could be that, oh, doing both actually makes it, makes it worse to predict neural responses. So one of the things we're doing now, we're trying to predict, prepare a paper now, uh, is we have some mathematical results showing that if I have this second task, what are the conditions under which that task will help me do the first task? And by how much will it improve my first task? Um, so that's a kind of thing. But. Okay, uh, that was a bunch. 
Um, I'm happy to answer other questions or, or go off on whatever tangent or a, a, as you wish. Uh, can I have the recording? Uh, yeah. Any last final thoughts, questions?